Hi, everybody. Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> we are in our living room. We are in our living room in the middle of the night, and I think if you've been watching us for a while now, you probably can already tell why, right? I mean, something is obviously going right, on. Right, we're on the other side of the, of the, living, of room. the living room. It's dark. So We have something exciting. Usually when we're up in the middle of the night talking to you, it's because we're talking to somebody on the other side of the, the planet. The world, yes. And we did that just now, which is why we're giddy, because we had a really, really, really oh lovely chat. With the most amazing Leah Purcell. With the most amazing Leah Purcell. Actress, writer, director, storyteller, extraordinary, <laughs> fabulous, amazing woman. Yeah, we are so excited about this interview. We're so excited we're getting to share it with you because, I don't know, some of you might not be from Australia, so some of you might not know Leah Purcell or haven't known her until now. And after this interview, I'm telling you, you should go and Google her. And, and you're going to want to see and read and do everything you can. Yeah, we're already discussing distribution to yes, exactly. international distribution. <laughs> anyway, she's really a remarkable woman, and she's a very generous giving interview yes uh i couldn't thank her enough for what she shared with us yes and for the time that she dedicated yes. to us and to all and of to you. you really so the now, fans yeah now we're getting to share it she with you she loves the fans we're so excited here she is leah purcell enjoy Anyway, okay. first of all we're so excited that you we really are we're absolutely thrilled uh we have to admit that much much like probably a lot of wentworth fans around the world we had to search you up and you know find out all, how prolific you are um but but we're quite in awe yes. of all your work and um, this is for us absolutely a thrill as you know so i have a question um you're a storyteller and we've heard that you the that you say that there's a question you like to open your interviews with to make the person whose story you're getting feel more comfortable so here it is out of the five senses, which sense do you relate to the most and what is your first memory of it? Yeah, thank you for this question because I think I love giving it to people so it's really nice to receive it. I've only ever received it once before Good. and it totally threw me and I couldn't really answer it. But I can now that I'm older and wiser. <laughs> um, hearing, I think, because I, I love hearing stories and um, I grew up uh, with my mum telling me stories we didn't have a lot of books we you know couldn't afford them but but she would always tell me a story and I guess it's 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 a it's an Aboriginal tradition of handing down oral you know our, our history through oral oral ways and so it's about being a listener and 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 and, and being a receiver and I guess that's also a big part in being an actor um, the, one of the biggest compliments you can get is when another actor turns around and goes thank you for listening so and 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 giving that energy of you really hearing me for even though it's the tenth take, you know. So um, yeah, hearing and 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 hearing all the stories from my mum, hearing all the stories from my elders. You know, I grew up around my. I think I'm last one of those last generations where you, you know before the Game Boys and all <laughs> technology play where you actually did sit. It might have been around a carton of forex. That's beer in Australia, but it was it was it was. There were so many stories that were shared, you know, old stories, traditional stories, and then contemporary living stories of who we are as Aboriginal people today. So it's definitely hearing. And do you remember your first memory of uh, having heard something? Of, of realising yeah. something? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I would say it would be the drover's wife. Because my mum, I, I was a little girl and I was in grade one because I had drawn in the book Nip and Dora and Fluff and one plus one equals three. And my mum always said, don't don't draw on the words, but if you've got to draw in there, draw on the spare pages. So I remember that story very clearly. And I remember her reading it to me and reciting it to me for many, many years. But my earliest memory, because it's, it's there in evidence of me trying to spell my name and do maths, was be around about five that I could recall that. And I guess the other story that, and, and you know, and I'm turning, I've turned that into a play. I've now turned it into a feature film, which we go into shooting at the end of 2019. And I also remember a story of my grandmother who was 
part of the stolen generations. And I remember when the storms would come, we'd all go and sit into her room and cover the, you know, the, the old wives' tale of covering the mirrors. <laughs> and we'd sit in there and, and she would, she she had arthritis and Parkinson's disease, so she couldn't talk very clearly. But my mother would throw questions at her and she'd nod and she'd tell us about the white men that came in on horseback and took them from their area and put them on a train. So I, I remember I remember being a little girl sitting on the floor at her feet on, on the bed and, you know, lightning and that kind of around. But I can remember going, man, were the horses pretty? Like, were they big horses? You know, I'm a kid of five or seven and nice. and she would nod and, you know, because I didn't – it wasn't until when I was about 15 did I realise what that story really meant and that I was hearing about that before it became a political agenda, before it became – you know, some uh, policy. So, yeah, so I do remember those. And thank goodness I've got a, a memory. My father had a great memory to recite and bring up history and, and stories. So I think I've been, I'm glad I could retain those and, and use them. Yes. And, and, can, and to continue to tell, yeah, can t to tell the world. I, I sympathize. My, my grandmother is a Holocaust survivor and I have memories of myself yeah. at five, at seven, sitting at her feet and, and listening to that. So... Yeah, it's definitely part, a, a sense of responsibility to tell the world the, the stories. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, since you're a storyteller, um, yep. I know that you can't give a lot away because this is an ongoing thing and we're all watching and curious and part of Wentworth's thing is to keep us at the edge of our seats and trying to guess things. Yep. That's something that we love to do on Talking Teal. Everybody throws their crazy theory in and actually we were on to the undercover cop a long, long you know, way ago. at the beginning. Yes, well done, well done. We watch a lot of television. <laughs> so what do you, how, what is the story that you tell yourself or what is Rita's story? Um... Look, readers, uh, the first word that comes to mind, she's very loyal. She's very family orientated. Um, our backstory for me and Radi, when we were looking at it, um, we said that we I was the oldest in the family and she's the youngest. And I said, I think there's boys in between because they're out doing their own thing, you know. Um, we I think we said that our mother passed away early and, and so I became that mother figure. Um, for the families and and so she's very loyal very family orientated she's also adventurous I think and that's why she went into the police force um, and then she you know worked her way up but she did of course there was the accident with Ruby and the pain that she caused the murder of the other young girl that was in there being an aboriginal girl there would have been a payback system or family wouldn't have rested so she had to leave and and leave that behind her and hopefully that ruby could you know continue on and have a life and keep the family safe so that that vendetta wasn't there um uh she worked her way through the through the ranks i think she was very she she, she does love the fact that she is a is a is a is, is a detective um but she's i think i think as i said she's very loyal she'll give, give you the shirt off your back um, she'll stand up for what she believes in. I think she's she, at, at the at the root of her she is a heart. You know, she's got a big heart, and but I think but she's also she doesn't take. I don't think she'd take lightly to idiots. Um, <laughs> and if you and if you crossed her, um, well, as you saw in episode five, she's not gonna muck around. You know, so. Mm -hmm. But I think I think I think she's one that you have to push her, and she'll fight for what she believes in. She'll fight for what is right, and she'll definitely fight for her little sister. And how much of that was actually on, I mean, how much of Rita's story was on the paper and how much of it was actually you interpreting and adding your own story? Yeah, well, of course, I, I got approached by the executive producers um, from uh, Fox and Fremantle and uh, producer um, Pino, um, and they, they they approached me to come and be the next story carrier, I call it, to come in like B. Smith's character did to bring the new to the new energy of storytelling through it. Um, and they also said that they'd love me to collaborate on that storyline and where and so they had a basic idea that especially the being a police officer but then it was all those questions and what does that mean in the aboriginal community and i came up well i said well if there's a death then there would be vendetta it doesn't matter if she's a woman in blue that's just cultural way of payback um it's something you know being a woman in the blue uniform with 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 the situation with aboriginal people with black people around the world in what what that means i said so there's a big responsibility um so I so we sort of broke down what we gave the writers um, and the producers was I guess 
our internal life with those stories, you know, giving them a bit more than just a surface and then and, and just sort of saying stuff, well, that's not quite right. We wouldn't do that or we don't live like that or that's not something we would do. Um, so I was, I was, you know, and, and to, to win me over, that that's always a big one where you do have a collaboration on your story. But but the writers and, and the script producer, Marcia, they're great in like that. So everyone actually can have a say when we go through the rehearsal process because, you know what, you can't beat an actors when they connect to a character like I think a great actor will take a writer's character and go deeper and then you expect your director to go deeper than you but no one can connect to a character like an actor does because we got to go there we we have to connect so deep it's our souls because only then can we reach the amount of emotion that is required in 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 when with and be true and be real and move our fans the way we do, whether we upset them or make them cry or make them laugh. That's part of our job. So I really, uh, I think it's it, it's a big plus to the Wentworth um, producers that they have allowed us actors to have that voice. So, of course, um, I was actually going to not, not retire from acting, but sort of semi-retire and put it on the back burner for a while so that I could focus on my writing and direction because I'm leading towards my, my feature film. And um, so when that came along, I had to pull the brakes up and I said, hang on, everyone, my team. And I said, hang on a minute. I said, I've got to put my actor's hat on because if I put that on and think about what this role means, I said, it's an established show. It's known around the world. It's considered a number one drama. I said, it's women. It's women's stories. I said, it's kick-ass. It's physical. I said, I think I'm going to have to do, <laughs> do this. So, so I, I, I'm glad I did. I ha, I'm having a having a ball, and it's kind of like when I'm acting, I can I'm actually kind of resting. I said, well, I'm actually resting. I said because no one can get to the set. We can't have our phones, and I'm getting a lot of work done being away from family and the everyday life. So it's um, it's been a it's a, it's a blessing in disguise. And then to come on such a show with with the caliber of actors, the caliber of story, the caliber of crew. Um, it's it's just a nice place to be. And the great thing about that is because the 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 the, the, the character storylines is like there's some emotional stuff coming up in series seven, let me tell you. Um, you know what and so to go that deep and to hurt that much, you have to have trust in the people around you, and that's your crew. We have guys that just walk in with ladders and turn a light bulb, but they sit down and they can dissect your character with it. Mm -hmm. And that's when you know that they care, and that's what you want because it's not me alone when I'm shedding tears or, you know, there's lovemaking or there's a fight. There's a hundred other eyes staring at me, you know, so there's no – it's all out there so you've got to have that trust and that's and that's what we do have and that's why the show is what it is mm -hmm. you definitely see that you definitely yeah. see yeah. that it's, 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 you feel it's, it yeah well and we always say that it's at the top of everything the lighting everything the editing is... the music the cinematography it's just the yeah. top of the the craft really it's, yeah. yeah you know the overall you don't notice it but when you're breaking things down as you see it yeah. it the the production values as, as well as, of course, the, the relationships between the actors are all so spectacularly good. Yeah, yeah, no, they are. And um, and uh, we even, you know, and you think that it can only, it couldn't get better, but the, the, uh, we've seen, been privileged to see um, episodes one and two of season seven, and the editing in that just takes it to another level. You're it's sort of like, wow. <laughs> you know what I'm it's so nice. I know, but it, it's so exciting, oh, you know. Oh, I can't and, wait. And there's, so much more, there's so much more still to come. You know, we've got a, another six episodes of, um, you know, uh, next week of of, um, of season six, and, and, you know, that just keeps climbing and climbing. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's it's great to sort of watch it and then get all the feedback from all the fans from around the world, you know, saying what they feel. And it's 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 it, it makes our hard work, we go – Awesome, you know whether you got your lovers, you got your haters, but it's 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 if my character has moved you in some way, then I've done my job, and it makes the hard work that we go through like those fight scenes. They're not easy, uh, you know, and and especially. But the emotional stuff, that's what really hurts because we can't lie to our bodies. So when we need trauma, we have to put ourselves through that to get those tears. And that takes a couple of days to recover from, you know, the bruises and that you can stick a bit of ice on and <laughs> and you know. You do. <laughs> Yeah, with it down a bit of deep heat and stretch it out and you move on. But, you know, when you've got to go there emotionally, there's always a dark cloud. So it's nice to get the feedback and it's nice that you can walk into work and get lots of hugs from Tammy McIntosh and, <laughs> and Susie Paul. 
you know, so, and Celia comes over, she's the mother hen, you're right, babe, you know, so <laughs> we're always sort of checking in with one another saying, do you need a hug, mate? You're okay, you know, so, yeah. Is that something that you think is different because the show is so really full of women? Is that something that's different from your other experiences on other sets? Oh, definitely, definitely. And these women have, and, and I guess me personally, I came in giving the utmost respect to these women because this is their show. I'm the new kid on the block and and I and I, I own that. And so you give respect where respect is due and, and they appreciated that and they, they welcomed us with open arms and and and, and, and I, I think yeah, I think it is because we are women and the beautiful conversations that we sit down and we have at lunch and we have at dinner and we're sharing, you know, or breakfast I should say, it's always they're all everyone's so giving and, and, and understanding and, 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 and caring and that you know, we don't have enough of that in the world these days. So it's really nice sure. to be able to go to, to work and, 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 and feel that, you know. That's wonderful. Um, you said by the way that you had a lot of insight into Rita, uh, Rita but Rita was actually an original character in Prisoner. So yeah. we haven't seen Prisoner, but it sounds like you did change her a lot. How how um, is she? Yeah, look, um, I, 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 when I, I, I used to, I did watch Prisoner when I was a little girl. Probably I shouldn't have, but I did. <laughs> um, and I think I remember Rita, the original Rita Connors coming into the show, but I think I must have, you know, I don't know, boys might have came into my life and I got distracted or something. Um, but uh, but I, I, I went back and did a bit of a Google. No, I think, the, look, the only difference really is, and, and, and you know, she was tough, but I, she was also very loyal. She was also very caring. Um, she took on a few people. She was more of a choker. Oh, <laughs> than a puncher. I see. They took advantage and, uh, of your boxing less yeah. than S. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, but I think I think you know I think there's a I think there's a lot that we're very similar. You know, in the sense of of, of a loyal person and and caring. And she really stood up stood up for people if she felt they were being hard done by. So I think that. The only difference, I guess, is us bringing in, um, a, a, you know, a, a, our backstory and, and the fact that we're um, me and Ruby are Aboriginal. You know, that's that's the that's the twist, I, I, I guess. But um, I love the way she came into the show. She came in in, a, in in the in the van, but all of her bikey mates were following. <laughs> I love it on the bikes, yeah. right? And, oh, she was yeah, a biker. That would have been she wasn't an undercover cop, right? Originally. No, she wasn't an undercover right. cop. So I think that's yeah. that that that's the big that's the a big, big twist. But, yeah, yeah, it is, and and you know, and that's, I think I think you have to have those clever things. I think we we've got to have those twists. We've got to have those surprises. We've got to have that so that the audience follows with me. Because of course, there's trials and tribulations of me now, trying to keep that secret, you know, a secret uh, undercover alive. and keep the secret <laughs> staying alive and staying alive. And and so I think it was clever that they told that in episode four so that the audience knows so hopefully um they're on the edge of their seats where people go oh my god don't go down there you know or, or this is going to happen and that's going to happen so i think that's nice so that the audience are one step ahead of me mm -hmm. you know in, in when things happen and trying to keep that secret a secret i guess unless we think at least we think we're one step ahead <laughs> exactly yeah. you never know what went well. yeah. Yeah. yeah and does she have is this her biggest secret really or does she have more secrets that yeah, she's going I'm to. thinking about that, and yeah, it's funny because you have because we're so engrossed in series seven, you got to go. Hang on a minute, I've got to rewind yeah. that back <laughs> um, and think. No, I think I think it is her big secret, but it's it's now the 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 challenge is to keep it keep it a secret, and and hopefully you know she's got to be on her toes now, and she's still of course trying to bring Mari down. So there's there's a there's a bit more at stake now with that mm -hmm. secret being out, and hopefully it engages the audience to follow and scream at their TVs, don't go down there, Rita. Yeah, oh, don't go please. in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> By the time we post this interview, they'll probably already see episode six, but that Zara chick, she looks scary. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, you know, um, Natalia is a lovely lady. And we worked together years ago. She reminded me she had a small part in another show on the ABC called Fallen Angels, and I was a social worker. And she was there as a gymnast. Oh. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, but she was lovely. But yeah, yeah. No, she's got that. She she comes up great. So I'm really I'm really happy for her because she was all you know she was all nervous and oh, it's a smaller role and am I doing okay? And I said you're doing great. You know, it felt good to work opposite her and and uh, so we we had fun. Oh, well, yeah. Rita is just such a sensational character, and 
she has so many good points. I, I, I wonder what you like best about her, and if there's anything that you don't like about her, what you might like least. Yeah, look, um, I, you know, to be truthful, Rita's probably the closest character that I've ever played to my personality. Like, as an actor, you put a little bit of yourself through it or you take a little bit of your mum or you take a bit of an aunt or you take a bit of a friend. But... Um, I, I think she's. I think she's. Oh, what I love about her is she's so loyal, and she does have a heart of gold. And she she is a person that will reach out and help someone. Um, I don't. I don't think there's nothing that I don't like about her, um, because I, I I think she's intriguing myself. You know, the undercover, and I would have loved to explored, you know, her story more as being in the undercover with the bikey gang and fallen in love mm -hmm. with Ray. You know that's a that's that's a whole another world which was which as an actor you're intrigued as to what that means when you go into un undercover and I did talk to a detective that went in and and how fast that would have to move and but I think you know she genuinely wanted to find love and in a crazy way Ray was the one that sort of gave it to her they were they had something um, you know apart from the crime and being in the in the bikey gang there was there was some truth to them you know when they were on their own they were they were the, themselves and they could be themselves without the persona of the the, the tough bikies you know so yeah, no I, I think she's a cool cool chick we well, think so too. we like to write from the get go <laughs> and uh, just more and more every week we just well, fell in love with her and i love that you said that you were brought on to kind of take that fill that void because we were wondering who could fill that void first be left and frankie be, left right. yeah. and then just this last talking teal actually we were yeah, saying and I said, who filled the void rita. rita is absolutely that, it now. it's the charismatic presence mm -hmm. and you need to and, and somebody that you can truly align yourself with because you share you know values and you know she's not really a criminal that you have to kind of no. overlook certain aspects of her so you can like the other aspects and yeah, yeah. No, she's, yeah. she's oh, that's great uh, and you know, you, uh, we were talking about how you you added uh, your personal part to, to Rita, and I know that everything you do, you you like to add your social commentary. It seems like it's just part of who you are, and it's something you do great. Um, and I was wondering, how did you feel that Wentworth was doing in that social commentary department up until then? Yeah, um, look, it, it 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 it's hard because as an actor, you sometimes you just want to come onto a show and just. Just, just tell the story, and I think, I think for our, for our indigenous, because it is a drama, and you know when you go out to the real prisons and you talk to the consultant that they had on, on this, you can't get away with a lot of the stuff that we do in Wentworth. So that really brought it home that this is a drama, right? And, and we're telling some fibs, but we're telling great fibs, and we're going to make everyone believe that our fibs are true. <laughs> so I think for us to sort of go down the political agenda with a drama as this, I think. I think it wouldn't have worked because, for number one, you know, they need a lot more Aboriginal women in that jail than yes. that they have. Um, and and you know, sometimes the look, the, the the truth is so harrowing. You might not have got through anything. But I think what was great about the show is they always tried to have a representation with Jada Alberts, Hunt, um, um, Hunter Page, um, yeah, Doreen, um, Sharina Clanton, Clayton, um, you know, so so that the, they've tried. But I think with me and Radi being in there at the same time, we can actually bounce off one another and have have that energy, and we can we can we can we can layer our performance with our in, um, indigenous injection, you know, of of little things, of little traits, of little sayings, of little looks. Um, but I think if if I I, I wouldn't have wanted probably to play uh, in Wentworth if they tried to get political because it's always um, dumbed down, it's never done. And as an Indigenous person who writes, we want to tell our stories in our way and we want to drive that agenda. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm just happy for Wentworth to step up and have two Indigenous women in lead roles. Exactly, um, you one know, time. Mm -hmm. a, a story, yeah, story carriers, as I like to call it, um, into the new season, the trust that they had in us. And... and and, um, you know, it's about time that that sort of multiculturalism or, you know, aspect is, is, is met and set. And, you know, and Wentworth have have absolutely tried to make sure that there's people of all races in there. Um, you know, our extras are amazing, amazing women and, and the men that, that come in and play the wardens. They're of all walks of life and they love the show and... Um, and 
and I think I think that's what's that's what's been great uh, about Wentworth. They haven't been afraid um, to go there. Yeah, they're not afraid of anything much. You know, and uh, just a, a tiny thing that I want to say that uh, even with those little things that you that. Black paper, as you like to call it, like with a welcome yes. to country, for example. Welcome people, to country. people like us who really don't know much because we, we're not from Australia, you know, we don't know enough. And that those little lines already make us wait a second, what did she mean? And then you know, we have so we luckily, look up. yeah, we look this up, or luckily we have viewers yeah. who sometimes write to us and explain things. And so I think just with those little things, you're educating us more than we would have ever even known to look for. We're learning a great yeah. deal. Yeah, and that's and that's what I love about um, with, with allowing us to do that because on the page was written um, the multicultural convention, and I turned around to the director, and I said to Roger, I said I'm going to take this one step further, and it's be, I said I'm, I can because of who I am, and he goes, what is it? I said I'll show you in the rehearsal, <laughs> and I turned around with that line, welcome you to country, and they all cracked up laughing, and they said that's fabulous, and it is those little things that we put in that that as you said you might not understand what that is, but the reaction that you got from it and you could see the look in my face the action that comes after the reaction of people on the net you know a lot of indigenous people text me and said thanks sis I had a great laugh <laughs> <laughs> you know and I said well that's what I did it for you want to give our people the power because um you know I can only talk on behalf of the Aboriginal people if we don't we do now see a lot more of ourselves on on screen and telling our stories so where you can be on a number one drama in you know in Australia around the world and share a bit of that you know, there's a lot of power. There's a lot of power in that, and there's a lot of satisfaction. So I'm glad that you know. I know that you guys looked that up to see what that meant, and and look at it in the context of how I delivered it. So it's it's something that me and Rati, you know, we always try to do to um, put those little injections in. They sprinkle a little black pepper. Yeah, that's <laughs> great. So so we've heard that you were you were offered the opportunity to direct, but you turned it down because you thought that. Playing Rita and directing was too much. Now we know you've directed yourself before. So what is it about this show, this role, that made you decide? Nah, I think this is a little bit more of a bite than I can chew. <laughs> yeah, look, I said to him, they'd have to put me in the slot for three months, you know, because <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of prep work, there's a lot of post work. So um, you know that that would have been hard to um, get into direct and and then and you know break down the script prior, um, but but I think for me it's it's readers like at the moment we're just at episode five or six you haven't touched her emotional surface yet we've seen the physicality of her and the stuff that's to come is um, is pretty heavy and just knowing that workload I I, I said I I would love to um, but I just think I owe you know this is an opportunity I I, I signed on to act and I kind of want to just stick into my in in, in my lane mm -hmm. you know um and and because it's such a big ensemble piece as well that's a lot of work because not only are you a director and trying to get the performance you want and trying to make sure that the character the plot points are reached and characters are working there's also you become the doctor you become the mother you become the psychologist so there there was it would have been a lot of head space a lot of heart space taken up and I just I just wanted to make Rita right because when I work on something, I give 150%. And if I know I, I don't want to go outside my lane and I want I just wanted to do her so good because I'm 47. Who knows whether I'll get another role, kick ass as oh, Rita. You will. You will. You will. <laughs> you will. You know, so I just, I just I always, you know, you've got to leave people wanting more and that's what I wanted to do. And who knows what's going to happen in the future. And, you know, they asked me to even sit down and write, you know, an app. And I went, oh, gosh, guys, um, I would love to, but... I'm gonna say no because I'm just I'm just happy doing doing reader at the moment. But you know it's really nice, and I was very chuffed to be to be asked and to be put into that position. And yeah. terrible to say no. <laughs> yeah, but it's a great compliment. Yes, and you'll get you'll get more opportunities. You'll get yes, many I'm more. I'm sure. Um, and we, we talked about it a little bit, but I do wonder uh, what it's like to be exposed to this amount of insanely passionate fandom. <laughs> Yeah, look, you know, I, I heard some of the scary stories and, and you sort of go, oh, my God. And um, it is nervous. Like even Susie Porter, she said, oh, gosh, I'm so nervous, you know, because we do, we, you know, as us performers, we want, we're doing it for you guys. We're doing it for the people. We're doing it for the viewers. We're doing it for the fans. So I was very chuffed at seeing, um, 
you know, the, the, the positive feedback. And even the even the people talking prior, you know, who are these newbies and it's all gone to crap and I'm not watching. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, and then with another person, who's this reader? I love her. And I went, yes. <laughs> As a performer, that's what you want to do. You want to, you know, and even, and I felt sorry for Susie because her character, you know, is a lot more darker and she's a lot more sinister. And she was very nervous about that first night. And she said, because... You know, Rita has got a heart to her. Mari's a lot more colder and darker. And, and I said, yeah, but everyone needs a good bad guy and you're it, babe, you know. Exactly. I said, so you've got to own that. Yeah, and I said, and the more you own it, the, the more people have either they're going to – like look at look at uh, Pamela Ray, for example, um, the freak, you know, like holy moly, who would have thought, you know, she these, she's got crazy fans out. Oh, yeah, you know? <laughs> Yeah, and look, it's it, it, it's and that's what you want for a show. You want it to have an audience. You want it to have people that 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 care and and the conversations that go back and forth. And and it just makes you know it makes what we do um, feel you know we feel good about what what we're doing and and we strive to bring something more each time. Yeah, well, the investment is monumental in this show. The investment by the fans. I don't think yeah. I've ever seen anything oh, yeah. quite. I mean, I worked in the soap opera world, the American soap opera. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's something that goes on for years and years and years and years, and people actually grow up with characters. So that's a yeah. certain kind of investment. Yeah, that, it's an that attachment. That, like to me, family. I've never seen uh, until I, until Wentworth, <laughs> really. And, <laughs> yeah. And this is that same kind of emotional uh, commitment that people have to uh, Wentworth as they did to soaps that they spent, you know, 20 years watching. Yeah, and that's the yeah. only reason. We, Sorry, go ahead. No, I said we're very appreciative of that, and we, yeah, we, it, it's great. So yeah, thank that's, you. That's the only reason that people were so uh, reluctant before, you know, new people come because they were so attached to B. They were so attached to, you know, all these people. You know, it's, it's hard to give them up, but they will. They'll. They're all getting attached really quickly to all the new very people. Very quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and I just keep saying, you know, respect to them. I think it's very. I think it was very brave of the writers to, to, to. To, to kill off B, you know, I they there was something on the net where there was they did a thirty minute of her entire story, and I got to the end of that, and being a writer and, and that and a director, and I said there was no other place for her to go exactly. but to be, to yeah. be dead, and I think it was great that they that they were brave enough uh, to do that, and and you know, to stimulate fans and to see you know and and the great thing is that majority of them hung around and now they're on another journey, you know, yeah, and it's yeah. great. Yeah, it was very brave. We actually did a whole talking oh, tale dedicated to the five stages of grief. The five, we, exactly. <laughs> but we we loved the ending because we thought it was we thought like it was, she died a hero. That it was brilliant. She, yeah. Yes, yeah. It, it was. Yeah. It was. Uh, That's great. But we, we, we look at it a little more differently than a fan does. You know. Yeah, slightly less detached and more kind of like appreciating the yeah, craft and the, the artistry. A little bit more critical standpoint. And yeah. uh, it was uh, really a magnificent way to go, I'll tell you. Well, speaking yeah. of which, yeah. what what would you say has been your favorite storyline on Wentworth to date? Since we know that you watched it before you came on, right? So you, you know the storyline. Yeah. What's your favorite? That's yeah, not Rita's. someone else's storyline? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah, I'd probably say um, Liz, Celia Ireland. You know, uh, Celia and, uh, is, is a phenomenal actress. She's and. And yeah, and where and where you know she, where she's going now with losing her mind and where that story goes, she, she does a great job in underplaying that and what she does. And my and of course my other big when I was watching um, when Wentworth first started and at the end of first series, I said I really want to work with Celia Island and, and Katrina Boomer, you know. <laughs> And, and when they hadn't rung me by series four, and I said, "Okay, something's going on," I got a bit worried. And then, of course, when I got called up, and I remember sitting in the first read and just watching these two ladies, and you know, fanning, fangirling out on them, it's kind of big time. And then all of a sudden, it went quiet, and I went, "Oh my gosh, that's my line!" <laughs> <laughs> because, because they just, yeah, they're, they're they're amazing ladies, and they give so much, and they know so much, you know, right back well they were there you know so uh, i think i think where celia's um storyline is going is um pretty special oh yes are we gonna, i don't know if you're allowed to tell us but yes. we're, are we going to get to see rita interact more with liz and boomer yes oh good, good. that's all i'll say <laughs> good 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 <laughs> that's all we'll ask we promise yes. um you know I, a lot of your work is informed by your own life experience a lot of the things that you uh, do uh, other than of course Wentworth and uh, and you've been very open about that and uh, if you had to name three things that inform your work the most what would they be 
Um, I guess, I guess, um, truth, rawness, um, and probably bringing understanding as opposed to educating. That's where I guess I, I come from when I sit down uh, to write or to work on, on a project. I try to bring the truth to the situation. I bring the rawness of me because I haven't trained in anything. I just, it just comes from my heart and soul. And then I don't, I don't like to use the word educator because, I don't know, it becomes too square or too locked in. But I, if I can bring an understanding of another person's trials and tribulations through my performance, when I write about my great my, my grandmother being for the stolen generations, my mother uh, was from the the oppressed women where they had no voices and they uh, limited education. They were all turned out to be maids. So, if if I'm giving an understanding on what they went through, what my grandfather when they were great grandfather, then I'm then and and I'm giving someone that flip side to the coin. Um, that's what I call my understanding. I'm not trying to change anyone's perspective. That's up to them. That's entirely up to them. But at least they can see something from the heart and soul as opposed to a political agenda where a lot of our issues are driven. So that's, yeah, I guess that would be my work. And you've also been very open about your own life. I mean, Box the Pony, that which we haven't been able... Where can we where find can Box we find the Pony, it? Black Chicks Talking, and, well, eventually The Drover's Wife, or at least read the book, something. Where can we find them? Yeah, yeah. look, yeah, good question. The the, the Box the Pony and Dro um, uh, Black Chick Talking are with um, Hachette, the publishers in Australia. Um, look, I've... Uh, um, they're... Um, yeah, there's got to be a bookstore out there. You know, they they still um they're still being published. It's 20 years coming up, so that maybe they might give another run. I think in next year is 20 years. I think for Black Chicks Talking outside so they of might Australia that, too. Uh, beg your pardon. Outside of Australia too, because now you now you you've gone global. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, who knows? They I, I might have to talk to them about that and see what that 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 does. But I you know um. I, I, I got very excited one day when I saw um, Black Chicks Talking in a second-hand bookshop that's notorious, you know, all the good books go there. So I got very happy when <laughs> I saw it on the shelf and I said at least it's being circulated and, and getting out there. So, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure whether you're going to have to write to Hachette or uh, uh, Drover's Wife, the play is with Currency and um, Hachette um, is in Australia. So, yeah, um, but anyway, I'll, I'll let them know that we're going to have to get it out wider yes and when you do the drover's wife in advance tell them that they need to think about international distribution yes because sure. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we're tagging that onto the film as well so um I'm gonna do the, I've, I've done a first draft of the novel um i've got to get eighty thousand words i'm about 50 60 uh first draft that was hard work novel writing is hard work even though i know this story inside out but i'm excited to get back to it so then we'll do the film start filming 2019 september october just at the end of our, our winter coming into our spring and um, then they'll redo the book and then hopefully 2020 the feature film will be out and around the world. So we went to um, Cannes Film Festival this year in May and got some really great responses from um, international distributors about the story. So that made me feel good, you know, because I was just a little C average student girl from the bush who didn't quite understand what going to school was all about. Um, so I'm really, um, really proud of myself that I kind of I done my master's degree. I'm saying, you know, that uh, that the international distributors were really touched by it and moved, and um, we're in you know conversations now about deals and so forth, and getting script out to actors. So it's kind of becoming real. It's great. You're obviously so, yeah, it's exciting. So, You're obviously yeah. So actual. hopefully, I think. Well, yeah, I, I, yeah, I hope so. You know, I, I just say it comes back to my Aboriginal heritage. We've been storytellers since time began, so you got to tap into your gifts, you know. Um, but hopefully, uh, uh, you know, I think the the publishers will probably, you know, um, I don't want to say cash in, but you know, bring out the other books as well because the profile's risen mm -hmm. again. And absolutely, yes, we're, said, we're looking for it's it. risen high. We're yeah. looking for all of them. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. it's, it's at an apex right now, so it's great. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Um, so, so you use your life uh, as your experiences, and was there a, a moment that you, that you decided to do that, to use your life as, as uh, to inform your work, or was it just organic? Did it just happen? It, and it, I think it was just organic. Like, I was always 
Like I was even a my, – my mother was a very caring person. You know, she raised seven children on her own. Then she helped raise two nephews. She raised two white boys in the town, town that never wanted to go home. She looked after her mother for 27 years who was crippled with arthritis and Parkinson's disease. You know, looked after her dad for five years. As soon as Nan died, he moved in. And and then, you know, within five years, of he, he died. And then she ended up with bowel cancer and died at 60, you know, when her life was really only starting to, 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 to happen. So I've always grown up around. And she was doing um, uh, reconciliation long before the word became popular you know there would always be aboriginal people and there'd always be non-aboriginal people in our house and yet it might have been around some music 45s playing and as i said a, a carton of beer but you know it was great she was well respected if anyone mucked up they'd tell Annie flow Annie flow would be over and grow you know so i grew up around this woman who cared and nurtured and showed a lot of love and showed a lot of acceptance of a lot of people and i was like that at school going through um i'd always be the girl that held the boy's hand that was you know dry or he stunk or you know and you know and and just helping you know I, I can't stand bullies I was always standing up for other people so it's just something that come and then I guess through myself how I learned or how I put myself back on track and wanted to you know make something of myself it was other people's stories you know hearing my grandmother's story hearing my mother's story I was always very interested in history so at 15 I would ask questions and 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 go I'm in such a good and hearing that their stories changed me I knew that through my truth and my honesty that it does make a difference. And when I do go out and talk to young people, you know, I was pregnant when I was 17. I, I had my daughter when I was 18. I turned 18 in August. My daughter was born in September. My mother died in October. Um, you know, so it's so it's just, and I know that, and I had to grow up quick, uh, you know. So I know that when you speak the truth and you've been there, done that, um, especially the young Indigenous people where I say there is hope out there, but you've got to make it happen happen for yourself you got to dream because whenever whenever I said I want to be an actor my family said well look you, you, you're from the bush you're a woman you're black you know maybe try to think of something else but and I you know I'd change my mind and say okay you know my mum said you can either work at the meat works or be a nurse so then I said I'll become a theatre nurse I didn't know what that was <laughs> I just thought I'd be singing some Broadway song sewing someone and that kept them off my back but it also kept my team alive you know so um so that it, it, and then I, and when I did, you know, do a first talk, one of my very first talks was when I, I wrote a song about my grandmother and her stolen generation plight. And, and there was a big movement in the early 19, um, 1980, when did I get down? Around about 80, 96, 97, when, when the stolen generations was coming forward, the land right movement was coming through. And there was myself, uh, Lower Joe Donahue, um, Noel Pierce, and Aidan Ridgway, and they are political blackfellas in this country. And so they sort of spoke more on the politics side. And then at the end of this talk and this big fest and there'll be people, you know, saying things, the naivety in the room was just appalling because they'd say things like, I heard that you guys can take my, can come up to my backyard, right up to my washing line. And you're going, oh, come on, guys. And, you know, it really doesn't give us anything. It's just a tireless. It's just to stay, we still have to jump through hoops. And and uh, and at the end of these conversations, um, and everyone would be, you know, there'd be people that'd be riled up and there'd be others that are understanding. And then I'd just get up and sing my song about my grandmother and just tell them the story. And then because and cause at that time, a lot of people saying that, you know, black fellas weren't here and, you know, Aboriginal people weren't, you know, and we went, come on, guys. I said, for you to do, this is my grandmother's story, is all that the stolen generations didn't happen. There was no massacres. There was no stolen land. And I said, this is my grandmother's story. You can't deny her that because if you do, she doesn't exist. And she does. And that's when I knew that just singing a simple song flawed people. The toughest of men that were in that room would come up to me later and just go, thanks and walk away. And I went, I did my job. I'm just having you think a little bit and maybe consider something when you're thinking or the next before you, the next time you open your mouth. So I think for me in my storytelling, I know that if I I find that truth, it, it, it's what works for me when people are honest and they're being truthful, then I can wear that as opposed to a lie or trying to cover up stuff. So I just felt that that was where, that was where I could capitalise and, and, and make some bring about understanding or make some change to someone's thoughts. So, and through Box the Pony, it, 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 it proved um, that that's, you know, the, 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 the oh, in those days it was faxes that I would get and letters, <laughs> uh, 
you know, of people and men too sort of saying, you know, my mum had a bit of a drinking problem or my dad or, you know, the domestic violence. And one woman said, I brought a guy to your show when I left him. I knew he wasn't right after, you know what I mean? So it's sort of, I said, oh, well, good for you, you know, if I could empower the people power. to make a decision, then, then I know that I'm doing – I just believe that I was – I was blessed with my, my journey, and if I sat on the fence and did nothing, then I would be absolutely disrespecting what my grandmother went through, what my mother went through, what my ancient ancestors went through. Because I've, I've I've been given this chance and I've been given this time to make change, so I've got to utilise that. Otherwise, I'm I'm a, I'm a naughty girl. <laughs> <laughs> and has it been therapeutic or difficult or both? Oh, you know, you you know, you can't deny the therapy side to it. Um, and a spe but, but what's been great is I can do that behind the closed doors. I can do that at my, uh, you know, at a ridiculous hour in the morning when I'm writing. And then you get that out and then you go, okay, that was great for me. Now is it really good for TV? Is it really good for the film? Is it really good for the play? You know, when I did, um, I did a show called um, Red Fern Now and in the second series I wrote and directed the episode that I that I did and that was loosely based on my mum and dad's and my self-relationship as I was growing up. And um, and there was one day where I'm, you know, I'm sitting in my room and I'm crying and I'm going, oh, this is going to win me a Logie. And all <laughs> you. <laughs> you know, I said, but it was it was my therapy lesson and, and it was because then the next day I had a note session and I handed it in and we were working with Jimmy, the legendary Jimmy McGovern, um, who is um, from England and, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of great shows he's done. So he's a bit of a legend and he read it and he looked at me and he said, uh, he said, Leah, he said, uh, you know, it might have been good for you, but it's not for TV deleted. <laughs> so I went, okay, no worries. So I, I managed to keep one line. I got that one line in and that was my challenge because it kind of was, that was what I understood of me, of my purpose of being a young girl. I was there for my mum and I said I was sent to look after her and just do what I had to do, you know, and her death set me free, you know. It allowed me to do what I'm doing, I said, because being the youngest of the family, my job would have been to stay home and look after her, you know, if um, if she was still alive today. So it all sort of works out. But absolutely, it's a therapy lesson, but you've got to draw the line, and that's what makes you a good writer when you can draw back, pull back, get it out, and then go, now what really works for um, the, the, the genre that I'm working on or the, the format that I'm working in and that's and that's the challenge and that's what I like. Mm -hmm. Now you, you talk a lot about the women in your life. It sounds like you grew up surrounded by women by really, really, uh, I mean, you're just Strong. talking about your mother and everything she's done is like how, you know, women are such superheroes really. Um, yeah. And I've heard you say that uh, you think women should tell women's stories and men should tell men's stories because women's business is women's business. And I was wondering yeah. what you meant by that. Yeah, look, it's probably more in a cultural way. Like in in our way, we have women's business that, and that's what that's our, our business. And there's men's business, and that and that's their business. But I'm talking probably a bit more, you know, ancient tradition and the traditions that happen now. But when I was sort of putting that onto my book, it's sort of well, you know, I just think, you know, no one can understand a woman but another woman. I can't. I'm not saying that men can't tap into that and we can't tap into a men's life but and and I have have in, in Drover's wife I have sort of spoken about more of the men in my family but there's only so far you can go and I've worked on plays where you've got male directors directing and it, it was a female writer and and directing and then cutting a scene and thinking that they could just throw it away and get away with it and you go hang on a minute but to us women that means so much more than what you're seeing it as I'm not saying that you can't and you shouldn't um, but uh, but I also someone told me you know when you're starting out as a writer write what you know, mm -hmm. and my women and the women in my family have been such a big influence in my storytelling, and I guess I was doing gender matters before it became a you know I always looked at the woman and wanted to give her the power you know the power that my mother had in box the pony you know I play 15 different characters men and women but the power that my mother had in that the power that my grandmother had you know in those days women weren't getting any of that there was no you know lead. and then I get out and, and I start that show by do, by working a boxing bag a heavy boxing bag which people said what's going on here the masculinity in this in this feminine story you know so it, it's just something that it makes my pulse rate I get a um, race I get excited by it and when we can have our women up there representing who we are 
uh, in the good and the bad and the ugly of it all and getting it right for us as women, you know, it, it, it's empowering and I think it's important for younger women to come through. And it, it's time now, you know, so it's all all, all relevant and, and, you know, it's, um, you know, until I, I don't know, I, I might attempt a bloke's story down the track, but... <laughs> At this stage, I, I'm, 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 I'm for the, I'm for the female. And, oh wow, uh, we're all so there we with you. We're called lady parts, you know, and that's uh, what it's all about. For and it, us. it's, it's always about, you know, we always say that people should tell their own stories. Women should tell their own stories. You know, that we need more representation. But you, you know, you said indigenous, a cultural thing too. Culture is, you know, you should tell your own story so that you have yeah. total empowerment over your story, and uh, nobody else yeah. tries to see it through their eyes. Well, we no, could. and you know, and no one can beat that emotional connection that you have. No one, unless you're, you know. I saw the pain that it would it would have in my grandmother when she spoke about her love. I saw the pain in my mother. You can't, you can't, you can't make that stuff up. That where, and then, and then, and the proof is in 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 the reaction that um, Boxer Pony had. I, I did a read of it in Forty uh, Second Street and One Hundred and Ten. Avenue, Tenth, is it? Tenth Theater Avenue, Avenue. Theater Row, Tenth yeah. Avenue. And and like on, I said this would be a great test to see if the Americans will get it. And if they do, it's a good it's a good piece. But I got a standing ovation. It was only supposed to be a read, you know. And and you know the hall. I think the reading room fit 55, 70. You know they invited seventy five, and one hundred and one people showed up. You know, um, and the Q and A that went on forever. They had to literally shut the lights out for us to get out. So. You know, when when you're pouring your truth, you, you kind of can't go wrong. And I think a lot of, you know, I've been to a lot of writing workshops and you've, you, you as writers, you, you've got to go there. You know, you can shield yourself. You have to learn how to shield yourself and how to put a, you know, what, because what, there is, I, there, there's places in Box of Pony where I chose to turn right instead of left, you know, but that's the story I wanted to tell. There's a time where I went so far, you know, because there's always someone questioning, you know, family members, why did you say that? I said, yeah, but I didn't step, take that last step, which could have brought everything down or really, you know, let secrets out of the bag. I said, I have been very respectful to the story that I've taken from to the story that I need to tell to make a change. And in those days, that was purely for me to get on stage because I'd moved to Sydney and hadn't had that opportunity to showcase my skills. So you could say it was kind of selfish to tell us personal, so personal, to get myself on stage. But, hey, I'm telling my story and I know that I'm going to be great in it. And you've got to be great to get the next work, you know. Sure. And it took me three years around Australia and around the world, you know. So it seemed like it worked. <laughs> and, and you see how, I mean, it's universal. People's stories, even though they yes. have uh, different um, origins, they have um, uh, different kinds of people. It's uh, America is a melting pot. And women's yeah. stories are, are very much the same, even though, uh, you know, Native Americans, uh, indigenous people, that's a little bit different, but you saw how well received your work was. So how how absolutely. about coming back? Yeah. Would oh, you, absolutely. <laughs> would you like no, to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there's plans. Uh, unfortunately, there's only one of me. Um, <laughs> after the driver's wife, we had a lot of interest from. There was interest from Seattle, um, Washington. Um, we'd love to come to New York, um, and then um, and then we've got uh, connections in um, London. So when I um, get the get the um, the film up and out and uh, then we want to absolutely come and do the play and I'd love to do an international tour tying all that in and, and then I can sort of hand it over to someone else because someone said oh well why don't you get someone else to do it I said yeah I've got unfinished business and when I first performed that play I only we only did 33 shows at Belvoir Street in Sydney it's one of our prestigious theatre houses but it was a very short run and I told them I was getting busy but they didn't believe me and I said when I say I'm getting busy I'm getting busy I said so you know, wait now um, but but you know everything all you know, I believe in things come at the right time, and and um, and uh, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to come over there and direct in some sort of capacity as well. You know, that's uh, what I'd love to do. But of course, it's about you know, if I've, I've got a few shows that I can bring on my own and and be the star of. Good, that's what we want. <laughs> that's the way to that's do what it. We're waiting, what we're waiting for. And how about yeah. uh, does does Hollywood uh, in, in any way appeal to or you? Or film. 
Oh, yeah, look, um, absolutely. When you're a little girl growing up in the bush and, and you only got two channels and, you know, the Oscars and all that come on, you always dream about that. I grew up with um, Liza Minnelli and Barbara Streisand and Doris Day and they're my heroes, especially Doris Day. Um, I would watch because she was such a strong woman in, in her movies and she sang and she and she danced and she was a great actor. Um, so, yeah, you always dream of that. And and But you didn't say it too loud in Mergen because people thought you were off with the fairies. <laughs> um, but I sort of, you know, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd tell myself in the mirror, I had this mirror that I'd play in front of and performed in front of and sang with Whitney and all of that sort of stuff, dance with Michael. So, um, you know, you just... You just keep those dreams alive, and and you know when I went over and 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 was walking down Forty Second Street to get to Theatre Row, I'd just look around and go. I was a little girl, Aboriginal girl from Mergen, who said one day I want to perform over here, and and I was doing it, and I just skipped down. I literally started skipping down the street and had a smile. And you know, life's life's here to live. And you've got to put dreams out, and if they come back and they come to fruition, then that's great. But you should never—I never stop dreaming. So you know, I've got a another list that I want to um, tick off, and you know, and 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 keep performing, and keep directing, and and keep writing, and absolutely come over there and perform. You know, I've got my film coming out. Um, you know, Drover's Wife. I'm acting in it as well as directing it, um, and uh, so we hope to, you know, that the. Uh, that uh, America picks it up and 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 you know be be screened over there and and come over and do some Q and A's yes. as you do. But you know, absolutely, you, I'd be I'd be lying if I said that I never you know had the aspirations to do something in in Hollywood. What nowadays I don't know, um, but uh, but I, I definitely would love to direct over 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 there and, and bring and bring my work too. Well, we'll be waiting. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and when the film's done, we actually have a little connection to the Martha's Vineyard Film Festival. <laughs> Nothing in New York. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll keep in touch. <laughs> and uh, who, would, who would be uh, your dream person to work with here? Either as an actor or director or... Oh gosh, there's 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 Unfortunately, quite a few. Whitney and Michael are no longer available. <laughs> no, they're no longer. No, you know, I think Denzel Washington is great. I really love what he did with Fences when he directed that. I thought it was really uh, underrated. I thought he, I thought I just, I didn't realize it was him until the end, and I watched it and I said, who was so brave enough to just keep it at two locations and you know not do the obvious? And I said it's Denzel Washington. You know, Spike Lee's always been um, a bit of a hero in where he comes politically with his stuff. He's, he's um, doing a movie he's, right here he's doing, this week. Yes, on the island. Oh wow! Well. <laughs> For Netflix. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to think who else in the in the in the women's stake. I haven't sort of watched anything. For a while, because I've been busy on a show called Bloom and Wentworth. Yeah, exactly. Um, it does suck uh, what's the? Um, oh, his name's gone out of my head. Spiel, um, Steven Spielberg. Spielberg. Yes, yeah, Steven Spielberg. Of course, we got a, a great doco that I watched on him, and he's such a Fantastic. legend. And he's a man of my own heart. Some of the stuff and where he's come from and how he looks at things. And I said, oh wow. So I'm gonna, you know, rewatch it and study it a bit more. And uh, I said, wow, that he's. He's someone I'd like to aspire to, and the way just the way he works through that doco, I was really it's a very, I was blown away. It's a very good documentary. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember what it's called, but you obviously know the mm -hmm. one where he talks about all his shows and whys and his and his. But once again, his personal connection to all those stories and scenes that were taken right from his life. Et the little boy, you know, you're a crybaby. You know, that's. That's what makes stuff, and that's Absolutely. that's that's the genius. He has that's a lot of genius. heart. He, he a does. Lot of heart all, everything he does is filled with heart and, yeah. and nostalgia and golden light. I always think of uh, of his work yeah. being surrounded in kind of a golden light of yeah, memory. No, and you, yeah, you forget the stuff that he's done too. You know, so he's been around for oh, a yeah. long, long, long time. time. Mm -hmm. Now you you do a lot. You direct. You act. You write. You sing. Apparently too. So, which one is your favorite? Uh, look, I've got to. If I really have to pick, I'd probably say acting because you are the link to the audience, to the work, to the director, to the writer, and it's such an important, important link because if that does go down, then things suffer. <laughs> No you know, uh, so and, and it's and 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 the gift 
that you're giving in live performance is 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 just amazing um and and that experience that every night in live performance is there's something different and you've got to be on your toes and the adrenaline that it makes and then and um so i think i think you know and, and whether that's because i'm having a you know i've i've, I've directed for tv and that's blooming hard work you know that is i'm yet to find the joy in it although i love doing it <laughs> challenge i uh, you know i think a couple of more things under my belt and it just comes down to experience and 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 um you know i'm feeling a lot more confident now and 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 um and then and then of course everyone wants to make a film but you know it's kind of it's kind of tv now with the netflix and the stands and the amazons um where where, where you can you know get you get series up so i'm just but yeah I'd, I'd have to say acting because it's so personal and and you're in people's spaces and you see you see you see the effect that you have on them immediately so yeah. then theater is your favorite medium you think sounds um like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I'm being honest, yeah, because I grew up on, on um, you know, at, at school we had music uh, theatre workshops and and I well, I remember I was about nine when I went with my sister-in-law to see her sister in one of the school musicals and I just sat there in awe and I said, that's what I want to do. And, and you know, and, to, and, and I love, you know, not that it's a nice thing I shouldn't say, but, you know, when you're on stage and you're playing someone fierce and you walk over to them and you see people in the audience you know, jump out of their chair and crumble or you see them weeping or they can't get up. You shouldn't enjoy that. But you do as a performer because oh, you're moving. Of course you should enjoy it. It means you're doing it right. That's, that's yeah. what it's about. That's what yeah. you want. And that's, 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 why we go, exactly. that's why people go to the theatre. Yeah, we want so to go there. So they can have monster. that experience, you know. Yeah. So. And, you know, it, it's hard work but it's so rewarding. And, 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 and when you hear... The, the the conversations that they're having while you're there and you you're spitting on them and it, you know and and um, and and to see see their reactions it's 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 um, yeah it is is very rewarding and it's 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 and it's very in the moment and you're there so uh, yeah I guess yeah well, you would say theatre acting and 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 acting but I do love I do love writing at the moment you know it's been enough and once again you know I failed I failed English C average and now it, it's what I do for a living read scripts and 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 write stories and I'm enjoying the the relearning of 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 the of language and 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 grammar and and just you know trying to find my way through things and so I've, I've really enjoyed that and where you can take an embryonic you know it's at the embryonic stage the idea of something and then watch it grow on the page and then you hand it to someone or if you've privileged enough you you go into directing it but then you give it to someone else to fill the words and you see what they get because it blew me away when we did Drover's Wife and I sat around because I'm not an analyzer I can't analyze my own work and I don't think I want to be able to I just know that I was in the moment I was gifted it was a blessing I wrote it in ridiculous amount of time the first draft you know I think it was five days for the act one and two days for act two just you know, when I think this is going to be crap because I wrote it in seven days, and people went, "This is you're onto something here," and then to sit in the room with your, with your designer, with your, with your, with your wardrobe person, with the, with the, with another director, with these actors that I sort of employed because I knew they were, they were good at script, and to hear them talk about a show, and I was listening to them one day, and I went, "Hang on a minute, just stop." I was, "What are you talking about?" And they said, "Your script, fool," and I said, "Really." <laughs> And very, very special and intelligent. I said, "Will you, will you are, because it's all on the page." And I said, "I'm glad you guys see that because I just, I just see the craft of it and the creativity." I said, "I'm so glad that there's so much more, more, more to it." So it's been, um, you know, and that's and that's always exciting as as a writer where people get get where you where you're coming from and that was with a lot of the international distributors when we the film i was supposed to be pitching to them they were pitching to me and someone said that's on 10 to 15 minutes there was one guy that teared up and i went i'm afraid to speak (laughs) (laughs) ruin this moment you know at right now this is looking good so um and that was yeah i was really you know it was really humbling and 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 you just go all that hard work has is is finally paying off That's so great. We can't wait to see it. No, we can't. And it's finally out. Um, you, you yeah, yeah, okay. Well, so we're talking here a little bit of fantasy. Uh, <laughs> what would be your dream role to play in, uh, like, a classic musical? Okay. Um, look, I'm a, 
as I said, I grew up with Liza, so I'm going to have to say Cabaret, and I do love Chicago. Oh, <laughs> Chicago's my favourite. How many times have we seen yeah. it? Oh, a million times. I've yeah. seen it on Broadway about eight Roxy times. Roxy or Velma? And... <laughs> Beg your pardon? Roxy or Velma? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I do like my proper Oh, uh, I was going to say Roxy. Yeah. Oh. Really? Yeah. Good. That's yeah. good. Yeah. good. I can see it. It's possible that. Yeah, yeah, and and you know I, uh, I I was very excited about Color Purple too. If we come more in the contemporary time, of, that was I was a big fan of that movie, and it was great too. Um, I think I, I, I I'm just it has a, I don't know if it's come to Australia. Or if it did, I missed it anyway. That's been in the industry. There's always it's something. Great, we it's actually, a great show. We actually took Libby Tanner, Libby Tanner to, see to see it when, when she was when here. She, was here. <laughs> she loved well, it. Yeah, Broadway. Broadway yeah. yeah, it was a wonderful. Yeah, party. yeah. So, how about a straight play? What would be your dream role? Like any of the classics? Tennessee or? Williams, uh, Shakespeare, Eugene O'Neill, yeah, Neil Simon. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 um, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not sure uh, because I, like right where I am now, I'm probably sort of more, more about my own stuff. Okay, uh, that's, that's a great answer. answer. That's perfect. a perfect answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, what what is like? What is your favorite movie? What do you watch on TV? What do you like to watch? Yeah, look, um, at, at the, at the last couple of years, I haven't watched much TV. Um, I'm trying to think of one. There's a couple of HBO series that I got into, and I just can't remember the name of it now. Um, Big Little Lies. And um, well, the first. Oh gosh, my head's gone. What was uh, the first? Give us a hint. What was the, what was the one with? Um, Woody Harrelson and um, oh, oh uh, the True Detective. True Detective, yeah. True Detective is the first season, and what there was another one, something The Night, with the oh, uh, young The Night of. Boy. Oh, that was so great. Yes. The Night of, that was brilliant. Yeah, yeah. So I do, I really like that. I, I'm trying to get to the um, uh, the hand hands yeah, maiden, Handmaid, maiden. Handmaid's Tale. Yeah, that will oh, blow your mind. I've got that. Yeah, I've got that on the recorder. That's how behind I am. <laughs> um, so there are stuff like that, and then, and I guess, look, my favorite, favorite. Uh, look, I'm a big. I do like um, Tarantino's movies. Mm -hmm. um, I do like Baz Luhrmann's m movies. I do like Steve Spielberg movies. But I guess my favorite, my, the one that I keep going back to if I just need to have a good cry, and just you know, an old favorite would be Color Purple. I thought you know that's uh, that was pretty uh, amazing, you know, and and just just. You know, for that, and I see. I grew up on watching Roots as well as a seven-year-old, mm -hmm. and so I was very. That was sort of became my, um, uh, my political awareness. You know, watching my mum watch that and watching her cry and and say, "Why are you crying?" And well, this sort of happened to us. So that's like I first related to on a political agenda, I guess. And um, so yeah, but you know, my my favorite favorite of all time going back to would be um, would be Color Purple. Anything with a woman at the front, you know, oh, film yes. noises or. For, oh, for a lot, you know, just to but, kick girls kicking it. So yeah, but I mean, you know, color purple. I mean, someone claiming her life, taking her own life in her own hands, and you know that would. I can see how that would touch you very much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a great yeah. Uh, film. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. who who do you consider your role models, but both in life and in work? Like who inspires yeah, you? In, yeah, in life, I guess it, it is my mum and my grandmother who inspire me. They give me my drive to 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 do um, work. Was you know, I don't, I, there's not many that 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 do what I do. Um, no. But you know, like for example, working with Kate Shortland on Somersault was my first female director. So seeing how she she was such, she's and she's a tall lady too so but just seeing how she presented herself and she was so assured of herself and I'm sure she, you know deep down she was all nervous and everything but just you know that I went when I direct I, I want to be like her and she and she had her lipstick on and you know she 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 wasn't running around in tracksuit pants or <laughs> or joggers so it was nice to see she still had you know she was still being a woman mm -hmm. so that was 
encouraging and uh, and Jan Chapman, I guess, in Lantana, you know, she was a little feisty go get a producer that I'd because I was always because I never trained in anything, always would always watch and observe. So when they were talking about meetings, you know, I'd be pretending to read my script, but I'm listening and going, ah, oh, that's what they talk about, and that's how that happens. And you know, of course, I guess another. A uh, strong woman influence would be Robin Nevin. She's an, a phenomenal actress over here. Uh, she's one of our senior leading ladies. You know, just watching her craft and her process, and and where you know a bit of her backstory. She didn't have it all all easy either, but she you know carved out a path for herself and made a name for herself so there's been a few different people there's a lovely there's a couple of lovely blokes Ray Lawrence is a big influence and a mentor in my director and he was Lantana and Jinderbine mm -hmm. so there's people oh, that yes. you keep close and there's others you keep it you know you, you shun away so there's been a lot of there's been a lot of people that I've sort of taken from their basket of goodness and learnt from their mistakes, you know, would not that I'd tell them that, but you sort of go, okay, that's that way, I don't know if I'd do, you know, and just, so I, I can't honestly say that there's one person that shaped me professionally, there's been a lots of people, and even a couple of Aboriginal women that sort of crossed my path, and I believe that they're blessings, they're gifts from my mother, because they all reminded me of my mum, but they were writers. There was one, um, Dr um, Ruby Langford Ginneby, and I did an adaptation with Eamon Flack from Belvoir Street of her story, and it's a two-hour monologue, and I've, I've got to check the Guinness Book. I work, yeah, yeah, and it, that that like I needed help, you know, like that was that was big, and I sung in it. I played guitar, and it was a solo piece, but I had a guitarist to do live music and sound, um, but that was that was crazy. But I but I I believe she reminded me so much of my mum, and and then she was a writer. She had books, and we'd sit and talk on a level that I probably couldn't talk to my to my mother on if she was around, but she understood. You know, from a from a from a from a writing perspective and a performer's perspective, and then another one was um, who is a um, we're, we're related tribally, Aunty Ruthie Hegarty, and she wrote her books. You've got to get some of those, and hers was about being in the dormitory system, so the the the, the home system, and and my great grandmother was the Aboriginal warden of of that place. So it was interesting to read her story and gifted. By just you know reconnecting with those people and reconnecting with Annie Ruby, I reconnected with her mum just before she passed away, and she gave me some stories about my grandmother being stolen because she was a little girl that was a little bit older, and so you know life's puzzles brings, or life's journey brings the people that that I'm I believe in that 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 are, that are necessary to feed me or to take from or give me opportunities, and then as long as I'm prepared to what I take to utilise and give back, then I'm going to be rewarded down the track, I hope. Well, I am. I'm in Wentworth. I've got Phil. It's been 26 years in the hustle, let me tell you. But, you know, things come to fruition to those who work bloody hard. Yes, well, you seem to work really bloody hard. Oh, now, yeah. Now I have a big <laughs> job for you, okay? I have the biggest job that you're going to ever have. If you were queen of everything, yes. what would be your first yes. agenda? My first agenda would be to tell everyone just to, Chill the <laughs> hell out. Disarm everybody. Disarm everyone in the world. And then I said, and I'm coming, and I'm going to listen to what you have to say. Oh, wow. You're going to have a lot of listening to do. You're going to be even. <laughs> you're going to be, gonna be busy. so busy. And we'll work it out. And we'll work it out. I'm we'll sure you will. Well, Listeners, you need to tune into that fifth sense, right? <laughs> we just need somebody to anoint you now. Yes. <laughs> Yes, I say it every other day. If I were queen. <laughs> uh. <laughs> well, well, thank you so much. Yep. This was wonderful, Leah. It was just... Uh, it's been a delight. We, we uh, again, we kind of spent the weekend immersed in your work and, and reading up and watching, and, and we just, we, we couldn't wait to just, you to know... To talk to you. Yeah. And, uh, uh, thank you for reaching, uh, reaching out. You know, it's great. I'll keep up all the fabulous work if you can possibly... <laughs> we're know, have enough energy. Really, yes. we're, we're exhausted just hearing about it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you're fantastic. You you will be one of those women if you aren't already that people, young women will come to and ask for advice, and you'll be the pe the person they say is the their influence and their inspiration. There's no doubt about that. Uh, thank you. I'm sure they already <laughs> are in Australia, but now they're going to be around the world. So. Yeah. This must be a really wonderful time for you. Enjoy it. Enjoy it, absolutely. And uh, we can't wait for the rest of Wentworth.
Yes. Yeah. Yeah, me too. <laughs> It is, um, what is it? It's Teal Tuesday. It's, it's Tuesday. Teal Tuesday. Teal Tuesday. Yeah. That's right. When we wake up in All the right. morning. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you Leah. Thanks Thank so much. You. Bye. Bye. Bye.